what is UDL? Universal is like for everyone. How do we design learning given the fact that learners are very different from each other? When I first heard about this, I thought it was just another one of those education buzzwords. But after reading Katie Novak's book and getting the opportunity to talk to her, I am sold in this episode and help you really understand this powerful framework for personalizing learning in your classroom. Let's jump into this conversation with Katie Novak. So if you were explaining UDL to somebody who had never heard of it before, how would you explain it? So I, I'll take apart the words, you know, universal is like for everyone. So yeah. how do we design learning for everyone, given the fact that learners are very different from each other and they're dynamic, which means their needs are always changing. And so the way that I generally explain it to someone that doesn't know anything about it is imagine that you're having a dinner party and you want everybody to enjoy the meal and you invited 10 good friends, but they're all bringing a plus one and you don't really know anything about the plus one. So you probably have to anticipate you're going to have some guests who might be vegan or lactose intolerant. And so you're not going to serve let's say, a, a casserole for everyone with meat and cheese because you can anticipate that it's not going to work for everyone. So instead, you'd probably have something more like a buffet where people can make choices and create their own plates. And we want to do the same in the classroom because if we create a lesson that is one size fits all, I talk about that like it's a casserole, then we know that some students are going to be excluded they either are not going to have the correct support they need or it's not going to be challenging enough. And so designing a lesson that works for everyone means that we have to embrace the variability of the kids we serve and ensure that we have both supports that are there as options as well as challenges that are there as options. And it's very much about like a human centered design to allow learners to make choices for themselves. Is, might you talk about kind of the, the responsive versus reactive nature of um, differentiation versus UDL? Universal Design for Learning actually comes from universal design, which is an architecture concept, which yeah. is how do we design a building where if we understand the purpose of that building, we design it so every potential person could access that building and use it to its full purpose, essentially. And so it came out of... If you have a public library and you want everyone to go in and enjoy and celebrate their literacy lives and there's only stairs to get in, then you're going to exclude anyone who has like mobility challenges. And if you only have books in English, you're going to exclude anyone who is multilingual and needs books in different languages. So the idea of like this universal design is like, do we have what people need to access this opportunity and to reach the, the purpose of the goal? And that is essentially something that we can do without even really knowing learners. So I can universally design a lesson by thinking about what is the goal and what are high probability barriers in terms of student needs. And I can provide lots of options and choices. And so I have this lesson. But the issue is that even though I proactively designed the lesson, on the ground, it might not work for everybody. And right. so you need somebody who really knows the learner who can then differentiate for the learner and be responsive to help them get what they need. So as an example, I might say as a former English teacher, all of us are going to read a text with the intention of writing an argument on whether or not the author of this text is funny or is actually inappropriate. So uh, I used to have students read a transcript of a TED talk where a gentleman talks about his depression by making fun of his depression and saying, it's the secret that everybody experiences. And like, I just wanna put it out there. And so students had to write an argument, right? So I, I start off with something like that. And I can get ahead of the fact that I'm gonna know that students have very different needs. So some students might want a hard copy of that text. Some students right. might need to access it digitally so they can make the font bigger, change the contrast, potentially look up some words, have a read aloud, or maybe even have it translated into language one first to build background knowledge on the cognates and things. And I might even have an option for students to maybe work in a small group and have one student kind of like read each paragraph out loud and chunk the text. So I can like design that, right? 
However, a universally designed lesson in the hands of a teacher comes alive because you can then take that and say, okay, everyone, here's your options. Think about what works best for you and why and make your decision. And then let's say that the drafts of these things come in, right? And I have one group who just nailed it, right? They have a yeah. very clear claim. They have supported it. I have another group that it's all over the place. I don't even know like what their argument is. Now I need to pull that small group and say, okay, like you need targeted instruction on really clear claims, logical supporting arguments. You're over here with me. Not everybody needs that, right? So we can right. start with a universally designed lesson. And a lot of people say, can you give me a, a universally designed lesson? And I said, I can, but I can't guarantee that it's going to work for everybody because we yeah. have to then be able to really get to know our learners, to differentiate instruction. So I always say I could universally design a lesson for you using the UDL principles, but yeah. I wouldn't have a successful classroom if I wasn't always differentiating instruction. So gorgeous because they're so complementary. So the UDL yes. work is what we do in advance to say, we know, we know that problems are going to arise, not even problems, but just that everyone learns differently. So how do we plan for that in advance? And then we use data that we're getting live as the teacher to actively differentiate and respond to what we're seeing in the classroom. You are a master of metaphors. Could you explain that concept of learner variability? So, you know, imagine like, I'm going to ask you right now, like, Cindy, what is your favorite drink at a coffee shop? Ice matcha latte. Okay. And so every time I see you for the rest of our lives, you're going to get an iced matcha latte. And I'm going to tell you, if you come visit me in Boston in the winter and it's negative 20, you don't want an iced matcha latte. You're like, can you get me something hot? And so the interpersonal variability is that if we were all going to go to a coffee shop, we would choose different things. But yes. I love being able to really think about the context that I'm in and make a different choice if that's best for me. And so at a coffee shop, they anticipate that there's going to be ice drinks, there's going to be hot drinks, there'll be coffee drinks, there'll be tea drinks. And they allow the user to come in and say, you know, what do I really need today? And, and what I love about that metaphor is when we think about a coffee shop, we know that a lot of people like to put something to cool down their drink, which traditionally was milk or cream, but many people now are vegan or lactose intolerant and they prefer something, you know, oat milk or soy milk. And you don't need a lactose intolerant card to get the soy milk. It's available to everyone. And in classrooms, we often have supports available for some students, but we're like, no, you don't, you don't get that it. support because I've decided based on a one-time analytic, you know, view that you don't need that. So now I'm not going to give it to you. And, you know, uh, an example that I use a lot is providing audio versions of text. So I, if I were to take a really valid and reliable screener of my ability to recognize words, you would say that I'm a strong reader. And so I would never get the audio. But what about if I forgot my contact lenses? You know, if I ripped a contact or I forgot my glasses, I literally cannot see the text. And so you would say like, oh, well, I'm so sorry, you can read, it's not available. And it's like, but right at this moment, this is the accommodation that I need. And so how do we recognize what's necessary for some needs to be provided as an option for everyone? I just love this. Because I honestly had never thought of that before, which seems so silly now. Like I think all the best concepts in education are ones that you hear it and you go, ah, oh. and what a beautiful way to remove the stigma for learners of, you know, no, we all need supports at different times. And sometimes yeah. I learn best by watching a video and sometimes I learn best by listening to a podcast and there's no shame or so I think you use the coffee example when you explain variability to student or to teachers. Do you have a different yeah. way that you explain it to students so that they feel Again, I think a lot of the stigma lives in our students of like, well, I'm not going to choose to use math manipulatives because then everyone's going to know, you know, I need the math manipulative. So is there a way that you explain that to them or get them on that same cultural page? So there is a story that I loved when I was little. It's called Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And I think there's lots of versions of this story all over yeah. the world. 
But essentially a girl goes into the woods and she breaks into a house owned by three bears, which is a really irresponsible decision. And she starts like trying all of their porridge, their breakfast. And it's like, oh, this one's too hot. This one's too cold. This one's just right. And she does the same by creeping into their beds. And, and so I used to always tell my students that story to say that she only knew what was just right for her because she tried all the things. It. And so one of the things that I would always do is I would say, we're all going to try all of these. So you know that it is an option. You know how to do it if your context changes. And some of you on some days might decide to take a Goldilocks no thank you bite. And that's what we would call it. And so some days we would come together and I would say, okay, I have a new strategy today for note taking and it might work for some of you. And so I am going to model it. I'm going to provide some exemplars. There will be instructions. I'll give you feedback. I want everyone to try it. And then I'll provide it as an option for those of you who find that it actually supports your learning. And I think the same could be true with anything, which is you all know how to use math manipulatives, but the reality is that sometimes you might say, you know, this for me is like additive reasoning. I can do the mental math. I don't need them right now. But all of us at some point are going to get to the edge of our limit to solve problems without additional resources. And right. some of us, it's going to take a while to reach that point. But knowing that you have like a toolbox of, wait, wait a second. I'm stuck, but I remember that we all went through this strategy of if we're stuck, these are some things we can try. I love that. Well, and that even sometimes it can come down to the pleasure of the experience for a student. And I think we mm. don't talk about that with learners that, you know, today you might just enjoy sitting in the corner and listening to the book rather than reading it. And like I, the Goldilocks concept is so transferable in that, that it's both preference and it's when we're stuck. Does that? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, even with students too is... If you just tell me to read something and I don't care about what I'm reading and you don't tell me why I'm reading it, me personally now as an adult, I just want to get through it. Hmm. But if you tell me what I need to do with that, it will immediately change my strategy. So I listen to novels for pleasure all the time, but I specifically choose things that are not high quality literature because I like to listen when I'm running. And I sometimes right. realize that I stop paying attention. And if it's too good of a novel, I'll be upset and have to go back. So right. if it's like these really, really devourable, like, you know, mysteries, then it's like, you know, it's fine if I miss something, it's not a big deal to me. But I right. read very differently if I'm writing like a research response to something because I want to read it closely. I want a highlighter. I want to print it out. So it's really, tell me why I'm reading this. Tell me ultimately, what is the purpose? What am I going to have to do with it? And then there are some times that I would say it actually wouldn't be a good idea for me to listen because I don't have an audio photographic memory to be able to cite sources if I'm listening. So smart. Well, and it's just so practical because our goal isn't to have students who are good at school. And I think sometimes we lose track of that, of like, I just want my students to be able to complete this assignment. No, the goal is that when they're out there in the world and they're, they want to learn how to bake macaroons or whatever <laughs> their new learning is, that they know how they learn best. Welcome to The School Leaders Project, a podcast series dedicated to helping school leaders make positive changes in their schools and community. The School Leaders Project is brought to you by TODL, your all-in-one teaching and learning platform made for teachers and by teachers. We started as a passion project in a school that thought that teaching tech should be as innovative as teaching teams. And we're now loved by more than 1,500 progressive K-12 schools all around the world. So can you talk about that? I, I think this concept of developing expert learners was another one of those big light bulb moments for me of, we talk about creating lifelong learners, but what's the difference between a lifelong learner and an expert learner? An expert learner is essentially someone who is very purposeful, very self-aware, and very strategic, essentially. So when we're talking about an expert learner, it's someone who is really seeking out, why am I doing this? And then what do I need to be able to do this? And then how can I show that I did it? Right? So macaroons, right? Why am I learning how to do that? Ooh, I have a best friend and she hasn't been feeling well lately. And I know that it's her favorite, you know, delight. And I really want to go and surprise her and show her that despite the fact that she knows that I do not like cooking, that I... <laughs> 
took one for the team and made these for her. And so this is why I'm doing it. There's a purpose. And so I have to be resourceful of like, well, how am I going to figure out how to do this? And so, you know, I definitely would want like a, a step by step. A lot of food blogs have narratives and I just skip Ugh, the narrative. Skip I the scroll recipe. down <laughs> and I'm like, show me the steps, right? And then I would need to go to the grocery store and I would print out the recipe and cross out things as I go, you know, and ultimately I might bake them and go, wow, I screwed up. I might need to remake these, right? And so right. like somebody who is an expert learner is really, really self-aware. They take an initiative to try to figure out what they need to do. And they're always monitoring their progress and kind of like recalibrating. Adjusting. Because if I'm like, if I'm making terrible macaroons, I need to either go get a different recipe or call a friend for help. Or ultimately I might have to make something else and be like, mm, brownies are going to have to do it. But I'm always monitoring my progress. I'm always thinking right. about what am I doing? Why am I doing it? How am I doing? And is there a way I could do it better? So it's not the kid who necessarily is the highest performer because mm -hmm. certainly you know, it would be like saying that, you know, given the same opportunities to learn, everyone's going to learn at the same high level is kind of like saying, given the same opportunities for nutrition and healthcare, we're all going to be the same height, right? Like there are differences between us, but how do I get to the, the place, the highest place that I can go, right? And I have to do that my way. And I think too often we adults make decisions that prevent kids from reaching their true potential because we're not providing them with the pathways they need to get there or the culture of error they need to recognize and learn from mistakes. Beautiful. Yeah, so the, the metacognitive piece of it and the reflective element of learning of this is what I did that worked and this is how I know it worked and this is how I might use it again in the future. It's like creating that inner system of I don't know, tools for learning. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I love it because in your book, you have an entire chapter that compares UDL to differentiation mm -hmm. because that was a question I had going in my head. We want to transfer or shift the ownership of students making decisions to students. And when people push back and say students are not making great decisions, I can generally you know, predict that there's not a lot of time for students to really reflect on the decisions they're making and whether or not they're effective. There's probably not a lot of feedback given to mm -hmm. students on the choices that they're making from teachers to help them make more responsible decisions. This is not just choose what you want, good luck, but this is the purpose. These are the pathways. What do you really need? How will you know that you are in that appropriate productive struggle? And if you realize it's too easy or you realize it's too challenging, how will you adapt? I think there's a lot of confusion around firm goals. Could you speak to a little bit, what is a firm goal? How do we craft them? Kind of the nitty gritty there. Yes. So you know, it depends on the course, <laughs> but essentially the yeah. firm goals are the pre-stated objectives of what all students have to know and do as a result of the course. So, you know, in some courses, like I teach graduate courses, I create a college syllabus. It will be, they'll be called objectives, course objectives, right? If you're working in IB curriculum, it's, you know, or if you're working, um, you know, with particular like state standards or national standards in different countries. But essentially it is going to be, the goals are what is it that all students have to know and do as a result of this course? What are the competencies? And being able to differentiate between the different types of goals is really important to determine the flexibility. So sometimes there's something that students have to know, they have to understand it. So a lot of students all around the world, we want them to be able to explain some of the causes of World War II, as an example. And so explain is a very, very ambiguous verb because I could explain by giving a presentation. I could explain by writing. I could explain in a video. I could explain so on and so forth. And so right. when we're looking at our our content goals, our firm goals, we're going to see words like analyze, describe, communicate, explain. And that lends itself to like so many options for how students are learning and how they're sharing their learning. But there's also standards that require students to produce writing or to solve linear inequalities or to 
give a presentation that includes um, multimedia elements or they have to okay. sing or whatever that happens to be. And I think sometimes there are some misconceptions about UDL that, oh, writing is a barrier, so they don't have to write. So mm. since writing is a barrier, students can make a diorama or they can just give a presentation or they can make a video. And no, right? They can leverage a lot of technologies like using voice to text to produce writing. And that's a beautiful tool that's available to all of us. You will never know what parts of my books were dictated while I was driving, which part were typed with my fingers, which part were scribbled at 2 a.m. on a notebook that I keep by the side of my bed. You'll never know, right? And I think that that's really important for students to know that all of those options exist. But the firm goal of production of writing is non-negotiable. So when people say to me, what's the first step with UDL? I'm like, you have to know your goals. And yes. then you have to know the success criteria for those goals. And then you start thinking about the variability of your learners, the barriers that they might face, all the different pathways that you can provide. So your first step really then is to go back to your curriculum. Just, I feel like you go back to your curriculum you sort the standards based off of kind of which ones are more flexible and which ones are not as flexible. And are you doing that? Mm -hmm. You said based on the verbs. So the verbs are kind of giving yep. you clarity on where we're going with the standard. And then from there, you define that as an objective and you say, this is what success might look like. Step one. Step one. And, and success sometimes is breaking up that standard. So for example, okay. like I'm an, I was an English teacher, so I know a lot of the English standards, but you know, explanatory writing, research of primary sources, reflection, analysis. None okay. of those things are negotiable, right? So there has to be research. The research has to be analyzed. And then there has to be some sort of personal interpretation or reflection of that. And so it's the success criteria is like, must use, you know, high quality research, but then like, how do you define that? Right. And then what does it mean to analyze and what does it mean to reflect? And so that's the success criteria is saying, you know, what are all the parts of the whole that really need to be like lifted up and highlighted so that if we're saying to students, you can choose, they're not going to choose something that doesn't allow them to meet the needs of, of the actual task, the assessment. And I often see choice boards, which is just a way to organize options. But sometimes choice boards have options that are not focused on the same goal and don't require the same rigor. And so we're not all working towards the same goal if that's the case. Okay. So we have our firm goal. We have our success criteria. And then the second big piece of it becomes the potential barriers to learning. So is there like an order of questions you ask yourselves? Is there a framework that you use for that? Like, I know you've got the, the um, UDL guidelines, but is there something else when you're thinking of barriers that you start with? I generally start to think about, you know, I academic barriers first, right? And then I think about behavioral, linguistic, cultural, social, and emotional. So sometimes I can make a lesson academically accessible. I can pre-teach the vocabulary. I can provide options for students to listen to it. I can allow them to work together, right? But if it's a really triggering concept, right, and I haven't done the job to think about how I reduce the social emotional barriers, or mm -hmm. if I don't have a classroom community that works really well together, you know, there's going to be some additional barriers. And so I think that those generally are the domains of the barriers we think about. And I think if COVID taught us anything, it made us much more aware of the social emotional needs of our learners, as opposed to just saying, well, I know I have some students who can't decode text. So I'm going to pull out the vocabulary. I'm going to have rich visuals. I'm going to provide sentence stems. And, you know, it comes down to a lot of scaffolding. Another way to think about this is there's really three large families of scaffolds. You have your linguistic scaffolds to help with the reception and the expression of understanding and language. You have your conceptual scaffolds, which is, I might have the language for it, but I don't understand it. I always use the sentence, derivatives are math tools. Mm -hmm. Linguistically, I can read it. I can say it. 
I have no idea what a derivative is, right? So I have like all the linguistic background I need, but I don't have a conceptual understanding. So I need maybe a model from the teacher. I need opportunities to, uh, you know, explore in more detail. And then the sociocultural scaffolds are, can I get feedback on it? Can I work with someone else? Does it align to my lived experience? Does it tap into my cultural capital and my funds of knowledge? So there's lots of places where a lesson could fall short. And I think that the more that we get to know our learners, the better we are at predicting potential barriers that they might face. It's almost like doing a pre-mortem of your lesson. Like what are are all the ways this will die? What could go wrong? What could go wrong? It's so clever. And I think it gets to the heart of uh, such a major issue in education is that we need to be crystal clear on our success criteria. And this is like, mm-hmm. I stand on the soapbox and say this often, that if we don't have clarity on what we're assessing, then we can't properly differentiate. Then we can't account mm-hmm. for learner variability because we don't know what kids are supposed to be doing. But like you're saying, if we have clarity on what we're doing, it becomes easier to find different pathways to get there. <music>